time once again for Community Forum. And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Dr. Yasser Abu Jameh. Dr. Yasser Abu Jameh is executive director with the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. And he is in town for the fourth annual Kairos Puget Sound Conference, the Intersectionality of Justice and Peace, which is uh, begins this morning at 9 o'clock, runs till 4 o'clock at the Seattle Mennonite Church. And we'll give you the address of that at the end of the interview. Dr. Uh, Yasser, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. So if you could start out, tell us about uh, the your organization, the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, and how you got involved. Thank you very much. I think... Uh, uh, the Gaza Community Mental Program was uh, initially an idea that came to the mind of our founder, Dr. Yad Saraj, who was a psychiatrist working in the 80s in the only psychiatric facility that was available in Gaza Strip, which is a psychiatric hospital. Those were the days of the First Intifada, and he noticed that there were children and women suffering from the implications of the uh, 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 night incursions, the invasions of the Israeli army, and he thought that... Uh, a child, you know, suffering from trauma, for example, is not going to come to the psychiatric hospital for treatment and for care. And then he started to think, what is the best way to offer uh, therapy, to offer treatment, to offer counseling to this kind of uh, uh, of client? And he came with the idea of just establishing a community mental health center where a comprehensive mental health approach is going to be uh, available. And in 1990, he opened the first community mental health center ever in Gaza Strip and perhaps in the Middle East, where a psychiatrist and a psychologist, a social worker and nurse were working as a team together to offer comprehensive mental service to a child or to a mother or to a family, where they could basically address the basic needs of those people who were suffering from the implications of the violence that was taking place at that time. Now, throughout the years, it was uh, uh, interesting that we received a lot of international support from experts in the field of mental health, uh, saying that this could be a perfect approach for people who are traumatized and how to present services. Uh, a few years later, we established our second center in Khan Yunis in the south of Gaza Strip. Another few years later, we established a third center in, in Dar al Balah in the middle areas of Gaza Strip. And today we have three community centers that provide care for as much as 3,000 people uh, throughout the year 2017. And how did you get involved? Uh, I, I was uh, a new graduate of medicine in the year 2000, and I was just returning back to Gaza Strip. And then uh, my initial uh, idea was or preferences to become a pediatrician. So I was working in the uh, 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 pediatric emergency department at Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis, where I noticed many children who come in the middle of the night screaming, you know, and without uh, known reason. And it was something like a myth for physicians what to do with those children who are coming in the middle. of. We speak about children of the age of two, three, sometimes five. And some of them were suggesting that this might have otitis media, some problems, ear infection, for example. And others, they were thinking maybe it's a colicky pain on the uh, uh, abdomen, you know. What was interesting is that those pains will just appear in the evening, in the middle of the night, and by the morning everything will be fine and will be gone. And we speak about the times of the second intifada, which began in the summer of the year 2000. And that was something like a puzzle for me that, you know, people living in a very uh, uh, places at that time near the settlements will have their children coming with those presentations. So uh, at that time, I heard about an announcement for the Gaza Community Mental Health Program about offering a training, two-year training on mental health. Uh, so I thought, why not to go and uh, to join that training program? So initially, I was just in that training program and doing my pediatric uh, uh, residency. And then I started to see the connection between trauma and between the presentations of the traumatic event when children were really facing. So I thought maybe it's better to serve better those children to just focus on uh, uh, mental health, you know, that could be a good starter. And I was really uh, very much uh, inspired by the work that Yad Saraj was doing and the organization was doing back in 2001, 2002, and how they were really helping families and helping ch children go on with, with their life. And I established the linkage between mental health and physical health at that moment. So at a certain point, I dropped the idea of becoming a pediatrician and I just joined the uh, psychiatry or mental health. Uh, and that's how I started working in that field. 
and uh, it was a very big, uh, let me say, uh, decision to make. But uh, now I'm really, I would say if time will, will go back, I'll make the same choice again and again. So I'm really happy that I made that choice and I'm really happy for the work that we do in that organization now, helping as much uh, kids, as many kids as, uh, as possible. It's worth to say that uh, GCMHP is currently the main mental health service providers when it comes to children with uh, with various mental health issues, including those with trauma-related uh, issues. Uh, but your program does serve both children and adults, Of right? course, yeah. yeah. Uh, GCMHP provides a secondary and tertiary level. We speak about primary prevention, we speak about secondary preventions and therapy, and we speak about rehabilitation or tertiary prevention. We try to... Uh, uh, we deal with uh, children and adults, we deal with men and women, boys and girls. We try to offer as uh, a very comprehensive uh, uh, service. We also have a toll-free line where people can call, you know, who are not sure whether they need a, a psychologist or they need a psychiatrist, some counseling, uh, who are afraid maybe of from the stigma or they have lesser accessibility uh, to GCHP. Accessibility is an issue now because of the high poverty rate in Gaza Strip, so some people will not be able to even offer the transportation cost. So they can call free of charge, whether they are calling from a landline or a mobile line, line and then we would really uh, have a, a good interview with them over the phone and then decide whether they need further assistance, whether they can come to our community centers or whether we can also send our teams to see them at their premises or in their communities. So are the traumas that children endure different uh and how so for traumas that adults endure? It's, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the exposure to traumatic events is, is pretty high in Gaza Strip. But this is because it's a small geographical area. It's about uh, 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 18 to 20 miles, or no, I think 24 miles in length and about 8 to 12 miles in width. Uh, in that small geographical area, 2 million Palestinians live, including 70% of those are refugees. Uh, more than 50% of those inhabitants, 2 million people, are children. So we speak about 1 million children who are living in that small geographical area. Now, when, when, when things happen every now and then, we speak about three large-scale military operations. For example, 2008, 2012, and 2014. For example, in 2014, more than 6,000 shells were falling on Gaza Strip throughout 51 days, uh, 51 day of military operations. So the exposure, I mean, no one would really miss that number of shields that are falling in that small geographical area. So the exposure rate to trauma is pretty high in Gaza Strip in all uh, uh, times. And the difference is that, you know, uh, children have different, uh, uh, I mean, the child looks at thing a little bit different. The apprehension of what's really happening around us is different from a child point of view. And then the implications, the understanding of a child, uh, and most importantly, how they show the symptoms, you know, the symptomatology of the traumatic event are different in adults than in children. An adult can come and say, I feel terrified, you know, I didn't know what to do, I was confused, uh, I, I was scared, you know. I have some abdominal pains, you know, something is wrong with my knees, with something happens. They can relate and they can draw some uh, 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 some linkage and they would really understand what's happening one way or the other. But for a child, it's a different story, you know. For a child who is uh, maybe seven or eight, the only presentation of, uh, 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 or the only response to a trauma could be bedwetting, for example, could be night terrors, for example, could be low school achievement, for example could be becoming more irritable, you know, more violent, you know. So, so uh, the uh, presentations of trauma on children is a little bit different. And if that is missed by the community, if that's not treated in time by the uh, uh, community, you know, by the parents, not dealt with properly, it could lead to more and more um, uh, 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 consequences and could really cripple the child de development, not only physical, we are speaking here, we are speaking mainly about uh, cognitive development, social capacities, uh, educational and academic development. So we need to address that in a proper manner. We need really to raise the uh, awareness of the uh, uh, community of the people in Gaza on how to respond to the children. It's also worth to mention that uh, trauma in Gaza is different from trauma in other places, you know. Uh, if you speak about um, uh, 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 
uh, I don't want to, to, to draw comparison first. I, I, I hope that not a single person in the whole world will be exposed to what happened in Gaza. But if, I, if we look at the uh, affairs that took place in, in California a few days ago, you know, this is a, a disaster that happened. And uh, again, my condolences to all of the deaths. You know, I hope that no one is really traumatized. But uh, usually after such a tragic event, uh, support comes in. You know, it, I mean, the, the trauma could, could, I mean, the, the event itself can, can last from seconds, like an earthquake. It could continue for minutes or like for days, like in the, with the fires. But when when things stop, you know, um, then support comes in. You know, support can come from the government, can come from the relatives, from the husband, the wife, the children, the parents, and the healing processes start immediately. You know, no matter how difficult things, but people start to heal. Now, in Gaza, things are a little bit different because there is no a traumatic event and then a post-traumatic status, you know, because, for example, any 14-year-old child today was really exposed to traumatic event through large-scale operations in 2008, 2009, 2012, and 2014. And then every now and then that child will hear a bombardment here and there. The skies are usually full of drones, you know, over the time in Gaza. We have cues of the traumatic event that would remind people every now and then that something wrong happened and even carry the threat that something wrong might happen again and again. And this would really hinder uh, natural recovery processes that humans have in response to trauma. And this will also make it more difficult for a community mental health worker to help people uh, uh, recover from those traumatic uh, uh, events. The implication of that we see in, in two things that we all the time have to deal with, which is the relapse rate, you know. So when you help a child recover from bedwetting, for example, or from nightmares or from flown, uh, f- full-blown PTSD uh, uh, symptoms, uh, that would work for a year or two. But if the same child is exposed to the same t- uh, another traumatic events a few months later or a few years later, they would return with with with, repa- with relapse, you know. And the other thing is, is the difficulty of um, healing, you know. Now, uh, helping people go out of the uh, 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 depression, for example, we speak especially about adults, you know. How you'd help a parent, you know, get out of his depressive symptoms when that man or woman know that they are not going to be able at the end of the day to offer uh, a dignified uh, a life for their children not even able to sometimes pay the transportation cost of uh, their children. I have many people, I know many people who couldn't offer to pay for their university uh, uh, fees for their children. So they started just to uh, think about some other means, I mean, or they stopped just thinking about higher education. So the best thing that they could reach is uh, high school. And it's pretty... uh, 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 really, uh, uh, it's it's such a painful thing for a parent that despite that they have a child with a very good grades, you know, but they cannot afford to help them go to the university. So the question, if if that parent really comes to GCMHP, uh, how could our professionals deal with that, given the uh, 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 fact that uh, uh, an immediate improvement in the life in Gaza is not going to take place? So it's uh, more of a uh, of a dilemma, how you could help people knowing that uh, the uh, uh, resources are not going to be as much as they should be. And I have to imagine that, I mean, children are are very smart and they pick up on things. So a child picking up on the depression and the frustration uh, that a parent or an uncle or even, you know, a neighbor across the street is experiencing just continues this cycle. Well, I, I, I can tell you one example. A few months ago in, in, in July, we, we heard the results of the uh, secondary school leaving examinations, which is the final uh, uh, exams before just joining university. And I saw many young people who are just still children, 17 or maybe 18 years old, who were thinking or asking question, why should we join a university if we see our older brothers and sisters or our parents who are also university graduates who weren't given the chance at all to to work in any place, you know, to make use of the uh, knowledge that they gain. uh, Unfortunately, the unemployment rate in in Gaza now is 53.7%, according to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics for the first half of 2018. And then when you look at the young people, 
that percentage goes to higher than 65%. So on average, two out of three people are not really uh, having the chance of just finding a job. And you know, for a young man or a young woman, finding a job means just the basic thing to establish a life, you know, to go on, to look for a family, to think about establishing the, your own, let me say, uh, uh, a future, your own independence, your own economy. This is something that is not uh, happening. So so those young graduates, univer- uh, I mean, uh, school graduates, some of them are dropping the university issue because they think that this is not going to help us anymore and anyhow for a better future. And they will start thinking about maybe some other businesses, you know, maybe they can try to find or to work in a carpenter, for example, if that's working. Because this is another issue, uh, one of the implications of the ongoing uh, 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 attacks on Gaza is the systematic de-development when it comes to the factories, to the economic conditions, to the infrastructures. Things are really crippled over those uh, years of blockade and years of large scale operations, etc., etc., etc. So a very poor economy, that's not really helping also uh, uh, people, young people mainly think of a better future, you know, and they live the reality and it becomes, you know, apparent to them that things are not that, uh, that, uh, that good. And of course, we say that all the time children see the fears in, of the, in the eyes of their parents when there are bombardment that takes place. They know that our parents cannot uh, find us a safe place. They feel that, they see that, and it adds a pressure on parents. But again, this is something that you have to deal with, something that you cannot change, you know, because uh, of the conditions that are beyond the capacity of uh, a basic individual living in Gaza. So you need to live with that, you need to cope with that, and things are not that easy to cope uh, with uh, uh, those days. So, so how does one cope with that? I mean, what, what tools or, or methodologies do you use to help either children or parents in that situation? Uh, first of all, uh, we start with saying that it's, it's very important to start as early as possible. So we have big... Uh, 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 psychological education or community education programs that aim at uh, educating people about mental health and how you should deal with the difficulties that you face on a daily basis. So we speak about stress management, for example. We, still, we speak about how to help children overcome the daily stresses, what they should do, parents, what they should do in times of difficult days, you know, uh, how to uh, uh, understand what's going on in the mind of their child and how to be able to cope with that and how to best deal with those uh, uh, sufferings in order to uh, enhance coping mechanisms, you know. For example, you can tell a child a story just before going to bed, or you can make a child, uh, tell a child that despite that there are some bombardments, that you live in a safe place, or that you do not expect that bombardment to come to your house, and that, you know, those loud sounds happen every now and then, but, you know, of course, it's uh, those sounds are still very difficult to deal with. It's a uh, loud, explosive sounds that you hear of like a war or two, and it, it's very difficult to uh, uh, to make a child feel safe. But uh, raising this issue, bringing it, making a child talk about that is something very important to keep, you know, healing processes open, you know, to that. And um, uh, then you need to give some some structures to the parents, what they should do in order to help the children. You can take them to a room that looks safer than another place. You can take them to a place that is safer to another thing. And safety is really a relative issue in uh, in Gaza when bombardment takes place and there is no really safe place. Uh, it's, it's odd, but for example, out of 2014, international reports say that 75% of the people who got killed or wounded, they were just civilians who were sitting at homes or waking in the streets, walking in the streets. Uh, so you need to address that uh, that issue. Another very important issue is that you deal with, we deal with uh, children. We work with children in schools. We work with children in, kind- in kindergartens. We spread the knowledge about how to deal with these things by involving school uh, counselors, school teachers, kindergarten uh, uh, teacher. We try to bring everyone to become involved and we get in direct touch with the community. Sometimes we organize uh, some fun events for children. We try to add as many colorful events to the child mind you know, as possible. So despite that there are some traumatic events, 
there should be some other uh, 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 good windows for a better future. You know, some spaces that would offer a child uh, a space to ventilate, to get rid of the negative uh, uh, implications of the traumatic event. So we try to do a lot of those uh, uh, things. There are, of course, some restrictions, but the biggest restrictions is the ongoing difficult conditions. We need really to start with having a post-traumatic uh, uh, time. When trauma is over and that you need to really focus on just healing and we need a community that understands that there will be no more traumatic event. This is, will be a very important asset for our work to be as successful as, as, um, uh, as possible. So we try to work with the community. We have our community centers who are open. We try to treat as many people as possible. We offer counseling services. It's not only therapy. We begin with counseling. If people are late for counseling, they already have diagnosis. We deal with the... We provide uh, uh, community mental health care. Uh, we provide uh, treatment for children through play therapy rooms, you know, or art therapy rooms, psychodrama with children. So we have various techniques that try to help children as much as possible. In, in Gaza, the hope that we have is in our children, you know, that they are going to have a better future than ours, that those children are going to be able to have a good education, you know, better chance, chances for the future. So a huge investment of a daily parent in, in Gaza is just the child, is just to focus on their child. So we try to make use of that, telling parents what they could do, telling school teachers what they could do. And it's really uh, 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 very much helping. But somehow we need an environment that is more friendly than what we have at the moment. And we hope that this healthy, uh, I mean, uh, uh, healthy environment is going to come soon and soon. And the key to that would be the Israel stopping its attacks on Gaza and uh, it's it's a very basic thing the the it's uh, this is a place that is under occupation the whole co international community know about that so the very basic thing is to end the blockade to begin with allow the development of Gaza strip and also to end the occupation you know because uh, occupation is a is a practice that should stop uh, and uh, it was stopped in all places around the world. The only place that is left on planet Earth uh, with occupation there is Gaza, you know, and the West Bank, it's Palestine. We need to put an end. And there are international laws that already set the uh, uh, regulations and rule who is doing what and where is Palestine, where is Israel and all of these things. Just we need to enforce and empower the Palestinian people and put an end to the occupation. We just need somehow to... Uh, 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 it's unfortunately, this is a, uh, we are dealing with the ramification of a political issue. So uh, uh, to begin with or to end the whole thing is to have a political solution. Until that political solution is coming, uh, we should have uh, 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 an improvement in the daily life of Gazan people. Uh, ending the blockade, uh, allowing us to just basically build our uh, society, go on with our lives, and ultimately end up with ending the occupation. We need to end the occupation. We cannot go with that. And uh, the U.S. obviously supplies Israel with a lot of its um, weapons, uh, supplies an uh, incredible amount of money to their military and to other projects. But in addition to that, didn't the uh, administration cut back on its financial support? of the um, few programs that it did support uh, in Palestine? I, I would say that the United States is the main broker when it comes to negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. And I think this is a very important thing that the United States is doing. It should continue to do that. Uh, uh, but I think this uh, could be in line with the international laws and regulations that were agreed upon with the United Nations, you know, and all those uh, decisions. Uh, the recent thing which was cutting the uh, 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 funding to the UNRWA has uh, already caused serious uh, implications. I, I would just like to highlight that each school, uh, UNRWA school, we have more than 240,000 children who go to UNRWA schools on a daily basis, six days a week. Now, unfortunately, the cut of funding caused uh, uh, the UNRWA to decide to cut the, uh, I mean, to move the school counselors from full-time job to part-time job, 
which means that those 240,000 children are going to be entitled to half of the psychological counseling services that they were entitled to in the year 2017. And this is just until the end of 2018. We are not sure about the future. How is that going to end up with? So imagine rather than to have one school counselor per, per, per school, we are going to have half of that rate. And we speak on average about 600 children per, per school. So the rate was already not that good. And now we have just doubled the, 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 uh, the lack of accessibility to the counseling services. And imagine those 240,000 children who are in need for more and more counseling, they are just getting less and less counseling. This is really very alarming. Our uh, hypothesis is that you need to intervene as early as possible. You have to deal with children and respond to the ramifications of the psychological or the psychological impact of what's happening around us. We speak about two big things that happen in school. One is low school achievement, and the other one is uh, uh, violence. The irritability of children that goes with the daily stresses of life with the loud hearing of bombardment voices make children irritable. Irritable means that he is not going to sit in chair, that he is going to scream, maybe he is going to cry, or maybe he, of course, boys and girls, or maybe she is going to be a little bit nervous. And imagine that in the backyard of a school, when there is rest for 30 minutes, you will see 600 children, let's say 10% of them are really uh, irritable because of the how many, 60 children, 70 children out of those 600, they are all in the same place and some of them are uh, uh, irritable or they're a little bit violent, you know. Who is going to deal with that if a school counselor is, is absent three days out of six from the school? So this is really something that's frustrating and it's, it's a dark uh, uh, image for the future of those uh, children. We need somehow to reinstore those uh, 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 school counselors. We hope that the number of school counselors is going to, 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 to get higher and higher. On average, we expect, you know, at least to have one school counselor per 300 school children. In Gaza, it was one per 600. Okay, but now we have one per 1,200 because it's half school counselor per 600. So this is a dramatic uh, regression in the services that are provided to school, to school children. And this is something that is really alarming. Perhaps we're not going to see the serious implication today or tomorrow, but in two or three years when those children are going to end the uh, school years, you know, not having good, performed good with the, with the school performance, if that continues to be the case, what's going to, to be the future of those kids? What's the future going to be for Palestinians? And the dark future for Palestinians is not going to be of any help to Israelis, by the way. It's going to have a negative implication of everyone in the region. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, we've been talking with Dr. Yasser Abu Jameh. He is the executive director of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. Um, how can people support your work? Uh, um, okay, I, I'll try to uh, make it short. One of the things is that uh, uh, you can donate, you can help. Uh, Gaza Community Mental Health Program through our twin organization, which is the uh, Gaza Mental Health Foundation. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have a group of people who are courageous, who come to Gaza every now and then, which is Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Please get in touch with them, support their work. They are also supporting our work. They bring uh, drugs and medications to, to Gaza every time they come. And all the time, please encourage your uh, uh, people uh, to know more about what happens in Gaza and to exert more pressure, you know. We need people to understand what's happening because we want, uh, 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 let me say, uh, more support, you know, from, from the United States, you know, for a just cause, for a just uh, end to that uh, conflict that you are living in now. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning.